Hey everyone, happy hump day. We are continuing our Sundance 2022 coverage with another round of great interviews. And we're still joined by our favorite film festival co-host and honorary bitch, John Wildman of FilmsGoneWild.com. So today, it's our Badass Women episode, where we're highlighting women of strength, resilience, and power in talking about the films Sirens, Midwives, and Long Line of Ladies. We'll get right to it. Enjoy. Welcome to Bitch Talk, booze interviews straight from the heart of San Francisco. I'm Erin. That's Ange. Hi. That's Char. Hello. You can find us at bitchtalkpodcast.com where you can sign up for our monthly e-news. For behind the scenes videos and two minute clips of our interviews, head to our YouTube channel and subscribe. You can find us every other Thursday morning at 9.30 a.m. at bff.fm. And if you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For the love of God, do it. It really helps. We are back at Sundance 2022 with the film Sirens, and we're sitting down with director Rita Baghdadi. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. So, uh, yeah, we want to get started by introducing our audience to your film. So Sirens is an intimate coming of age story about the two guitarists and co-founders of the Middle East's first all-female metal band. Um, And it takes place in Beirut, Lebanon. Yeah, I uh, love these ladies so much. Uh, And obviously my favorite scenes of the film are when they're just sitting and jamming and creating this incredible music. So I'd love to find out how you met them and uh, how many sessions were you able to sit down with them and just experience this magic because it was it was so cool. Yeah, so I met um, I I sort of discovered or I discovered the Slave Desirens via a small article in The National, um, which is a UAE publication um, back in 2018. And I saw this image of them. Uh, They were five young ladies all wearing black standing in the middle of a Lebanese forest. And I remember, (laughs) you know, Lilas, our main contributor was all the way on the left side, kind of away from all the other girls, like with her arms crossed and everyone else was like a little bit more relaxed. (laughs) And I remember being like, I want to meet this girl and I I want to meet all of these ladies and and who are they? And I went immediately and I listened to their music on Spotify. They had just released their EP and I was just blown away like by their talent. And so, you know, music is a big inspiration for me. So um, I just immediately messaged them on Facebook and got a hold of Lilas and we just started talking and um, basically just really hit it off. And then she invited me to come stay with her and and film a little bit. And so, yeah, it was just a few months later, I was on a plane to Beirut and and just kind of like lived in her house for a week. And (laughs) wow, reality, yeah. Um, And we just connected immediately. Um, And so that's kind of how it all started. Um, We filmed on and off for three years. um, So between 2018 and 2021. Mm -hmm. So how many sessions? I don't know if I could actually like count, but you know, um, a lot of band practices, a lot of just impromptu jams. um, And yeah, I mean, I I, I also love filming them playing. I think that it's, it really gives you a lot of insight into, you know, who they are when you see them play. Yeah, their process was really interesting to be a part of um, throughout the documentary, but I wanted to talk about, there's a lot of themes in this film. And I mean, one of the big ones for me was just love. Um, There's self-love, there's, there might be, I want to tease it, there might be a little love within the bandmates. And I want to know, were you seeing that process unfold organically while filming? Or did you kind of know that there's some underlying things happening within the band? So that was a thing that was sort of un- like unpeeled like an onion or whatever um like throughout the course of filming it wasn't immediately known um Mm -hmm. because it was sort of like secret between them anyway um I guess the rest of the band didn't even know um but even like I didn't even know any of them you know any of their sexualities or anything like Mm -hmm. 
for the first like few shoots, I'd say. That is something that came out with trust, um, each one in their own time, each one in their own way. And, but the love angle, absolutely the self-love angle, I would say I sort of tuned into really early with Lilas because I saw a lot of, you know, I sort of just saw a lot of my younger self in her and I felt like a sort of deep connection to her immediately. And I, I, I sensed her inner struggle really early. And I think that's what makes her a beautiful, you know, screen character, quote unquote, because there is so much vulnerability and rawness and all of that. Um, I didn't know how it would play out in the edit. I wasn't sure that that was going to be a central theme of the movie um, until we really started editing, because um, you really don't know what's actually going to resonate with people. But I'm glad it did because it's and it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I am too. It it really was the most relatable part of the film for for me as well. The the whole self love and you know it's not relatable to me to be a savant on the rhythm guitar, but <laughs> but you know where you fit in and and love. Yeah, it was it was so super powerful. But it, in regards to like the trust aspect, you're invited to Lila's home. What did her parents think of this? What did Sherry's parents think? Uh, one that you were going to be filming them, and also uh, have they watched the final final film? And, and what are their thoughts? Um, so when I think when I showed up, Lila's mom, I mean, she just <laughs> was so welcoming. And I think she, you know, just sort of thought I was one of her daughter's friends. And, you know, we're, um, you know, this is just like a little project. Like, I, I don't think she had any sort of sense for the scale of what the film could be. I mean, none of us really did. But, um, you know, me knowing the documentary industry, it's like, well, it could be something you just don't know. And so, I, and I also try to keep expectations, you know, kind of on the lower side, because if things don't work out, like if I had to, you know, I was never going to abandon the project, but like if something happened where I just couldn't keep filming or something, you know, I just wouldn't want to get everyone's hopes up. So I don't think I said much about like what the film, you know, was going to become, but she was just open to it from the beginning, you know, um, it took a little, you know, a little time and a little trust for her to be on camera um because I think she just didn't see the need she was like well this film isn't about me it's about you know my daughter and it's about her music and but you know I we had a lot of conversations about you know just what I was seeing between them and how that you know was really important um for the film and so um and she's seen those scenes and she um you know, she, she, she liked them. The only thing she just commented on like, oh, I wish I wasn't wearing that shirt or oh, I wish my kitchen was cleaner. <laughs> like, you know, just, like mom stuff. Um, and Sherry's, Sherry's parents have not seen the film yet. I don't, I haven't shown it to them. Um, I don't think Sherry did yet. So we're kind of, um, that'll be in the next round, but everyone else has. Well, and talking about the process of documentary filmmaking, to people that don't know, it does take years <laughs> really for these stories. So you started in 18 and then you finished in 20. Is that correct? Um, 2021, we finished filming. So then... you were traveling during a pandemic also. Yeah. Can you <laughs> talk about that experience? And also, I, were you there for the explosion too in August of 2020? I was actually supposed to be there and where I stay normally, um, the neighborhood, Marmachael or Jemeze, it's like the sort of, it's easy, easily walkable. And, you know, it's a little bit of, you know, touristy area, but um, it's right behind the port. And so the place that I stay, the, the lady that runs the Airbnb, I contacted her immediately after the explosion because um, I imagined it was destroyed and it was. So um, if I had been there, you don't know, I don't know what would have happened, but um, randomly, and I really cannot remember now why, but I had to push my ticket back. I pushed it back by like a week. And wow. so um, I ended up going like four days after the explosion or something. Yeah. Wow. So like, I just kept my ticket and I was like, wow, that worked out in a weird way. Um, but yes, yeah, so I wasn't there on the day, but you know. Mm. All the it's aftermath. aftermath. That's yeah. so crazy. Wow. The timing of all that. Um, I, yeah, yeah. Um, on that topic, I, I really appreciate that you bring up this idea of um, it, how children receive inherent, inherited trauma 
from their parents, specifically growing up in a, in a war-torn country. So um, can, can you talk about fitting in this footage of the war and, and civil unrest and, and how that sort of coincides with the story of these women in the band? Yeah, so I guess what you're for referring to is probably like the revolution going on. Um, and that, you know, it was sort of, it was sort of a no brainer that it was gonna be in the film. I just didn't know how, because I didn't wanna make, when I set out to make Sirens, like it was more than just making a film about this band. Like for me personally, I felt like I needed to like contribute to the canon of films that were gonna um, challenge Western stereotypes of, of Arab countries and of Arab people. And um, I really wanted to make a film that wasn't about all the bad things happening in the Middle East and how awful your country is and just wanting to leave and this and that. So I, I really did have to pick and choose like what I was gonna, what part of, you know, the country situation I was gonna show in the film. Um, but the revolution, you know, it felt to me personally relevant to the characters because they met in the middle of a, of a sort of riot, mm -hmm. they, call it. they met in a protest. And so their origin story is deeply connected to sort of the civil unrest in their country. Um, and it plays out in an interesting way, I think throughout the film, I mean, it's subtle um, sort of nuanced ways, but um, so going back to what was your original question? Sorry, what? No, just the correlations between the, the civil unrest and the, and the story of these, these yeah, ladies and how so they coincide, yeah. Right. So, right. That's how they met. And, and that was part of their origin story. And I thought that, um, you know, it made an interesting juxtaposition. And, and in a way, it, it was a way for me to show the audience, like, why their music is the way that it is, like, why they play this music. I mean, there's many reasons, right, why they play the music they do. But um, to play sort of such heavy, um, you know, aggressive music it's like to me it was sort of explaining that in a very small way it's like well there's all of this chaos around all the time and and how do you how does that get internalized and how do you express yourself um and that's just I felt like it was a, a natural organic way to do that I think it's one of the opening um scenes where I think they're jamming a little bit. I, I don't remember. It's right at the beginning ish. And then the singer just like unleashes. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, like, my hair. Wow. Back. It, was, mm -hmm. it was amazing. Um, if we can, I think we're going to wrap up soon, but can we talk about, I mean, again, we could talk through, you know, it's a documentary film piece. You don't know where it's going to go. And then you get two folks like Maya Rudolph and Natasha Leone behind the film. So it's going to do pretty well. Can you talk about that experience for you? Yeah. Well, again, that was really organic too. Um, when I came back from that very first shoot where I stayed with Lilas and you know, I filmed, I, I only filmed like five days in the end because I got really bad food poisoning. Um, oh, sorry. Not from her house, but from a, like a fast food right. place. And so I, I came back being like, oh, how am I gonna, like, I felt it deep inside that like, I knew I could make a feature film with, with the story that was about to unfold, whatever it would be. But I didn't know how I was gonna prove it to other people because when you make these samples, they're very, you know, there's this sort of end up feeling very superficial and then it's like three mm -hmm. minutes long and you're like, how do I, you know, how do I show you what, I, what could be? And so I, I was feeling a little bit like, okay, I only got five days of footage. What am I going to put together? So cut together the best thing that I could. And I showed it to a, a friend of mine, Lisa Heslov, who um, I actually shot her film sort of like a girl years ago. And, um, mm -hmm. And so I showed it to her and I said, uh, what do you think? You know, I wasn't asking for anything, just feedback. And she was like, can I show this to a friend of mine? And I was like, sure. And it turns out that that friend was Danielle Runford Barons, who was just starting a company with her friends, Natasha Leone and Maya Rudolph. <laughs> and they weren't in the And Danielle's from the documentary industry. Um, and she, you know, was making verite films, uh, you know, for many years. And so she felt a, I think she felt a connection to the material because it was, you know, sort of intimate verite. And she was like, can I show it to my friends? And she showed it to Natasha and Maya and they just sort of immediately loved it. And that, and that wow. was like literally the first, after the first shoot. 
So they were on board from sort of from day one, um, helping me, you know, just on the sidelines, helping me with whatever, um, raising money and those sort of things. Well, we can understand why they loved it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ria, it's really a powerful film mm -hmm. and congratulations. Thank you for sharing their story. We want everyone to go out and uh, listen to Slave to Sirens. It's on Spotify <laughs> yeah. and uh, support Sirens, the film, uh, which is premiering at Sundance 2022. We've been sitting down with director Rita Baghdadi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We are at the Virtual Sundance 2022. My name is John Wildman. I'm the editor-in-chief of FilmsGoneWild.com. With me are my two teammates on these Sundance interviews uh, from Bitch Talk podcast, Angela Tabora and Aaron Lim. And right now we're gonna talk about the documentary Midwives. And with us is the director, Snow Nia Lang, and producer, Mila Ong Thuyen. Welcome to the show, you guys. Thanks for having us. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we always like to start off the, uh, the shows by having our filmmakers introduce the audience to the film because they have not seen it as yet. So Snow, why don't you do the honors and tell us what Midwives is about? Hello, I'm the director of Midwife. Uh, Midwife is a documentary about two women, one Buddhist and one Muslim, working together in a Muslim village, western part of Myanmar, where Rohingya conflict was happening in my country. Um, in 2012, um, Rohingya and a Buddhist Rakhine community was a uh, conflict happened and millions of Rohingya, they flee to Bangladesh. But there are 16,000 of Rohingya stay living together with a community, Buddhist community. So it has been forgotten and no one was talking about that. So my sto story is focusing on two different community uh, coexisting together and they are helping each other. Also my two main character, two midwives, um, they been helping to Rohingya community and they have a very good, very interesting relationship. And one is a mentor, one is a apprentice. So I follow two midwife story about five years. Now I'm coming here with my film to sentence. So our uh, this is my third retelling documentary, and uh, it will be um, uh, premiering on the 24th. Yes, I, I can't believe this is your first premiere. Um, you know, we watch a lot of movies for Sundance. This was the first one that I watched, and it has stayed with me ever since. And uh, I was real excited for this interview, so I can thank you for putting a face to the victims of this genocide that's ongoing. And we're lucky if we even see one article in passing about what's happening right now. So thank you for that. And also for your resilience. You said it took five, six years to finish this film. And, um, you know, a lot happens in, in six years. So I'm interested to hear your journey, how the story changed and evolved throughout, and also how you changed uh, it, throughout the course of this film in, in very dangerous times. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for asking me because when I started this film, it was, uh, I was totally alone because like um, uh, I talked with uh, some of my friends about my idea, but somehow this region is really, you know, dangerous to go there. But for me, it's, I, I was born in Rakhine State, so I understand the language and I have relatives that live in, in, uh, in that region. That's kind of like, you know, I have I have some, some people supporting me in that region. That was kind of good positive things to me to go to that area. And, and actually the main um, reason that I want to um, give it to audience that they are co-existing together, how they work together, that was my main idea. But somehow, and within this like five years, so many things change. My character, they, there, they have like a Muslim midwife, she has a dream to leave the village, but then she couldn't leave it. And then like, then I was, I was like, my, my dream 
because her dreams became my dream, right? Because I wanted to follow, I wanted to support her dream. But then like her dream didn't come up because she got her pregnant. And then, so I was like, okay, this is, an, this is another story, it happened. But then I was said, okay, this is, that is it. And then after three years, see where what happened in, in that village, in, in that region. Because the reason when I started making this documentary, I don't really want to film in a conflict region because I want to be, I want to be safe and I wanted to be, you know, I mean like, you know, saber war area. I don't want to go to, you know, uh, something was fighting between like, you know, I don't want to go there. But somehow exactly in that village, it was happened like saber war happened and a lot of fighting. And it was, it was so much fear, not only to me, also my car rider. So when I go to that region, like I was really prepared for like, uh, you know, how to, how to maintain calm to my car rider and also how to be really protected my, myself, like not getting arrested from military because there are military checkpoints on the way to the village. And then like another thing happened is military coup because, because my, I, have, I have no plan to end with my, my story with this coup. Now it's like my story become very little story, two women's story is, is brought, is bringing like a lot of, you know, layer and it's maybe you can also understand about my, my country because of, because of this little story become like, it's touching so many layers. Yeah. So well, I think, you know, what, what is so remarkable about what you've done here with this film is balancing all of that that you, that you just talked about. And you know, and uh, you know, I um, I had the opportunity to to uh, do PR for the Venerable W. Barbe Schrader's uh, film um, about the uh, uh, truly terrible uh, Buddhist monk uh, Ashwin Withrow, and you know, and and this is such a, a strikingly different film within that same world, and it's because of the delicacy um, of how, in a way, that you nor you 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 make that life normal to us. You know, through this wonderful relationship between these two women and between this this world, so we see the war going on around us. But we also, in fact, you know, the, um, uh, I think La uh, actually says it uh, during the documentary that like going, we have work to do, we have things to do. We, you know, you know, yes, they're going to keep fighting, whether it's you know, uh, you know, the the, the Buddhist versus uh, uh, you know the um, uh, the Muslims, or whether it's the, the two army. Uh, factions against each other, but we have lives to save, and 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 I think it's it's truly wonderful how you've done it. Um, I would love for you to talk about uh, how. I mean, I know it's a five year process, but you know, people just don't let you let 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 you into their lives with cameras that easily. Um, so please please talk about for a moment. Um, with these two women and the process you went through to gain their trust to allow you to become, you know, almost a friend with a camera, I'm assuming. Yeah, so because I, when I went to that village, you know, I, I don't, they, I don't know any of them, like I, because of my auntie introduced me to these two midwives. And, um, and in the beginning, uh, because whenever I, I hold my camera and they were like, what are you going to do with this? Are you going to screen? Like, uh, you know, are you going to send to news media or, you know, I was like, no, I, because I wanted to understand about how you work together because the whole other people are talking about Muslim and, and, you know, Buddhist, Buddhist people, they don't talk to each other. That, that's what I knew, what I hear from the news, but, but how come you are working together? This is such a great, Think that you are you are working, and also every day you are helping to Muslim people. This is such a great. If you don't have this, uh, you know, great heart, you cannot do do it. So I because I tell them that you are such a hero in this village, and they don't really see that, you know. So I was telling them because you seem so hero to me. That's why I wanted to know more about you, and you have done really great job because even though they are working and living in the village and. Uh, you know, um, health care service to, to the people, they don't really see themselves that they are really important people. So, so I, I, because my, because I had to, 
you know, um, building trust, building between two of my characters. So I tell them, you are such a great hero and I wanted to learn more about you. And, and also I'm not, I tell them that I'm not journalist, I'm a filmmaker. So they said, you know, journalist people, they come and they interview and they disappear. I was, I tell them, I will come back and then I will not disappear because I'm a filmmaker. So I, I tell them that this is the thing that I want to learn. So it will be longer time then. Yeah, that, that was like, uh, yeah, it was, it was, sometimes they don't want me to, in the beginning, they don't want me to uh, take a video. But then I, I was telling them, you are walking great things to Muslim people. And I also want to know about, you know, uh, all these pregnant women are coming right in to this planet. So, so like whenever I yeah, but then like somehow they trust me because I because I I sometimes I didn't shoot. I was just you know um, staying together in 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 the clinic for the whole day. I didn't make it any of film thing. I just trying to make friends and then like visiting to new new village. Because in the beginning it was not easy because I look different. Also, there is also military. Uh, uh, there are soldier. Uh, they are. They have. There is security. Men are like just in front of the clinic. So it was really hard to go to Nunu village. But somehow we 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 went together, and then I make friend with Nunu. Then we become really connected. And then when we become really connected, it's naturally they. They know naturally that they don't really afraid of camera anymore. Whenever they want to talk, they, they come to, to the camera. So now we become like really, you know, sister. We are like a sister. I loved hearing that. Um, Mila, I'd love to bring you into the conversation and ask you when were you brought into this project and what's the feedback been so far as people are watching this film? Well, not many people have seen it, uh, except for maybe other film festivals. Um, and so people are starting, starting to get into great film festivals around the world, which is fantastic. But, you know, an audience hasn't seen it yet, you know, like my mom hasn't seen it yet. So uh, we're, <laughs> we're, uh, we're, we can't wait to, to, to show it uh, on Monday. Um, I came into the project, I, I, I'm half Burmese as well. My father's from uh, mm -hmm. Myanmar. And so I've always wanted to make a film there. And then I'd actually visited the same village that uh, right nearby the, the, where all the pagodas are uh, a couple of years before with my kids. And I always said, I want to go back here and make a film. And I, was, I went to uh, Myanmar to teach documentary filmmaking. And Snow was uh, the, a teacher there as well. So we met. And on the first day, she told me about her film. So imagine me wanting to come in and make kind of a similar idea about Rohingya in that town and then realizing, oh, I'm unqualified uh, like a thousand times over compared to snow. So all I could do is really say, wow, your film looks fantastic. How can I help? Right. Mm. So <laughs> at that point, I started going through her footage. And the lucky thing for me was she didn't really have any money. So I, I could say, OK, if I work on it with you and I can help you raise some money, can I help be a producer? So, which is kind of in my wheelhouse is like to, I do a lot of work with first time filmmakers internationally. And I love like digging into hours and hours of hard drive footage and just trying to find something that I think will work in the rest of the world. Like I always think like, you know, if, if this film can play in Utah and the Salt Lake City audience can enjoy it, it like, and it can play anywhere in the world really, you know, it can play. I think the best stories that I love um, working on are the ones that are completely interchangeable. Any audience anywhere in the world will get the human element to it. They don't, they need a little bit of background information on the politics, but the human element is the same. Um, Mila, I have to tell you, in the world of this film, you may be the only useful male. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, you know, uh, Correct. <laughs> watching the film, I'll tell you, you know, in the, 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 the moment where um, Yo-Yo is, is, is getting water for, uh, for her husband there and it's sitting right next to him, um, mm -hmm. I wanted to reach through the screen and shake somebody. Uh, and it wasn't her, um, you know, and, and then I'm just like nodding with uh, uh, Lo's uh, mom, La's mom, when she tells, when she told Snow to, to, to stay single. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm I was cracking up at that. Um, 
so uh, um, Neil, I, I would love for, so I would love for you to talk about that for a moment. Talk about the male female dynamic because holy crap, you know, I mean, from someone if they if all they watched was this movie, you would go that entire company that entire country is existing because of the women and and systematically being torn down by either ineffectual men or men with 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 weapons. So talk about that for a moment. I'd really love to hear what you have to say. It's not just that country, John. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> carry on. <laughs> Let's be honest. Fair point. Well, Fair what, point. You, what you just said was almost exactly what Snow told me at one point. She's like, women in Myanmar do everything. You know, like the men are kind of in charge, but they sit around and they screw things up. And women really, they have a certain degree of independence and they're very, quite powerful. And what's really interesting is my biggest one of my biggest shapers in my life is my Burmese grandmother, who is from a small village. In, but she, she, you know, she went out, she got a Fulbright scholarship. She left me in March. She came, the reason I'm in Canada is because she decided to like do very, very, she was very similar to Nyonya, where she was like, I'm leaving this village and I'm going to divorce my husband and I'm going to travel the world. And, you know, who cares that I'm just some Burmese woman from, from there, I can make it anywhere. And she taught in Cornell University, you know, so I was like always, I always assumed all Burmese women were just like my grandmother. And so that's when Snow told me that was her motivating factor in showing that I was like, I, I got, I get this. And I have to tell you, I had a great joy in, in painting the men to be buffoons. It was like, I felt <laughs> like I was betraying them, but it was like, I would just giggle whenever I see a man do something stupid. I was like, can we use this? Can we use this? <laughs> More of that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you for bringing that up, John. That's why we keep you around. I'm, I'm sorry. Did you, did you, were you going to say any, something? Snow? Yes, yes. Uh, of course, there are, all, there are a lot of discrimination uh, uh, when women, between women and men in my country. Um, there are also a lot of movement that like women doesn't have, you know, uh, right position. But somehow my Afrian West women do so much things, like even though they didn't come to their stage, but in behind, they do it a lot. So also I wanted to, this is my imagination, you know, women in Myanmar, they will be really, really taking uh, big roles in future. I want that. So that is also my imagination about women in Myanmar. I don't want to make documentary about women like who, like a fitting, you know, fitting mentality, you know, of course there are so much fitting women, but I wanted to point out something. Women have strong character, strong division, you know, courage. This kind of women also existing in my country. There are people always making about women as a victim. I want to make documentary about women as a, as a hero and leader, and then a friendship and then sisterhood. So that is my, yeah, my main idea to make a very strong women. There are a lot of women, strong women in my country, but they just need to tell, they just need to express you know, what they have been done. They just shut their mouth and then they just helping men to present on a stage. It, it is not true. And I think it was really like a credit to you, Snow, that you found like one of the ultimate badasses in Hua and decided like she was going to be your character. Like at the beginning, Snow was like, I want to show a story about friendship. And it seemed a little bit like, oh, it's going to be like a, a, a nice story about two women who are friends. But then I saw the footage of Hla and it's like, she's driving a motorcycle, delivering babies and swearing at people and like the most unimaginable swear words I've ever heard. Yes. And like, <laughs> and like telling off the authorities and other men and starting businesses left and right, popsicle business, fish business, midwifery, what, 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 you name it, you know? And it's like, wow, what a character. Like I, when I saw the scenes with her, I was like, this is, this woman should be like a Hollywood movie star. You know, it's amazing. Yeah, it, it's a lot. I mean, I mean, the film is kind of sneaky in that way where you go in going, well, it's going to be about this and this. And you go, oh, no, we've got a, a lot ahead of you if you're you know, if you're watching this. And, and congratulations on that front. Again, the film is Midwives uh, in the World Cinema uh, at Sundance 2022. We've been talking to the director, Snow Nilang, and producer, Mila Ong Twin. Congratulations, uh, both of you. It's just a wonderful film, and I uh, hope you guys have just an awesome Sundance.
Here we are at Sundance 2022 Virtual <laughs> Edition. Uh, we are here with Bitch Talk Podcast and FilmsGoneWild.com. My name is John Wildman. I'm the editor-in-chief of FilmsGoneWild.com. And I have the uh, dynamic duo from Bitch Talk, Angela Tabora and Aaron Lim. And we're going to talk about the short film, Long Line of Ladies. And we have the directors, Shandine Tom and Rika Zabachi. Um, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks, thanks for, for having, having us. us. Okay, now this is one where um, hopefully you two did rock, paper, scissors before this, because <laughs> I'm going to ask one of you to describe the film. Our audience has not seen the film as yet. So whoever wants to take this, tell us about Long Line of Ladies. Yeah, um, so uh, Long Line of Ladies is about a young girl, Ati Allen, and she is from the Yurok and Karadak tribes of Northern California, and she is in the film about to go through her coming of age ceremony called the Ihuk. That's short and sweet and perfect. And, but there's a lot that goes into this. And um, um, I think, uh, Angela, did you want to start this one off? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I really appreciated uh, one, just learning about this, this ritual, but I appreciated uh, the, the film's emphasis on the leading up to the ceremony and, and not really the ceremony itself um, because it, uh, there was so much beauty in just the, the community and the family coming together and, and realizing the, the beauty and, and the importance of, the, of a moment that, that we, especially you know, as Americans, have really been taught to mm. be sort of ashamed of and embarrassed by. So can you talk about your decision to really put the emphasis on the lead up to the ceremony and not the ceremony itself? I guess the emphasis comes from mostly, I guess, my own background. I'm Dene, so Navajo from the Southwest region of the United States. And I think there's always been an urge for filmmakers and all different types of artists or ethnographers to try and capture like what it means to be indigenous. And so I think the approach was definitely to try to get away from that um, ethnographic lens and try and find something that like had, um, I guess like what I know indigeneity to be, which is community and family and who you are in relation to each other. And I think that uh, is so present in this documentary. And I think it's like the emphasis of even just like ceremony, like ceremony is such an individual thing that um, especially this particular ceremony where Ati is like blindfolded and she's looking inward to herself. Um, we didn't want to disrupt that. And we didn't want to like try and capture what I think is like really difficult to capture in, in even in just a film because it's a, the family is going through like a lifetime of knowledge in order to be able to understand this. So I think we tried our best to capture the relationships that the family had with each other and their hopes for the future and all these different generations and how they come together to uplift a young woman. Rika, could you add to that a little bit in terms of um, like specific examples of the, the, how the two of you kind of mapped out, you know, when to ask to, to bring your cameras in conversations you had prior in setting up boundaries um, because it is it's it, it's it's such a sensitive uh, process you know that, that you know they're they're not it's not they're going through trying to revive something that's precious to them and you can tell um, which is wonderfully captured uh, you know uh, the, the delicacy of it with each generation and how they're approaching it and so how you approached the film that uh, I would love for you to talk about some specific examples that you made sure that you didn't overstep your bounds and that they felt safe with you. There were actually a lot of conversations kind of leading up to the to the shoot itself. Um, a lot of trust building with the subjects of the film, um, especially with um, Pim Allen, who is Ati Allen's mom. And she's, she's um, heavily featured in the film and she's also just an incredible woman and um, someone who's been really instrumental in um, bringing back um, these ceremonies um, um, to the Kaduk people um, and really passing on a lot of that knowledge. So Pim, it was a lot of having conversations with her and with Almi, who's Ati's father um, beforehand. Um, and just for us really trying to like we'll never understand the experience of going through the ceremony and it's not, it's not ours to understand, but you know, as much as we could, we would have conversations with them and try to understand like, what is, you know, what is the intention behind this thing that happens or what is the meaning behind this? And 
what is it like, what are our boundaries? Like, what can we film and what can't we film? What do you feel comfortable sharing with the world? And then what is like, what is just for you guys to experience? Um, and, you know, for me personally, it was a really different filmmaking process than anything I've ever done before, um, especially in documentary filmmaking, because I think we're just so used to in docs, just kind of showing up with a camera and, um, and, and really just trying to capture as much as we possibly can. You know, I think it's like, it feels like a strength when you can come away and you have more footage than you initially anticipated capturing. But with this project, it was very much like trying to outline beforehand, Shandine and I trying to outline after having conversations with Pim, Pim seeing that outline being totally clued in. She's a producer on the film. Um, so it's very important to get her take on everything and get her, you know, kind of her sign off on everything so that she had a clear like idea of the film that we were really trying to make. So there were really no surprises in the editing process. Um, and we just found that to be really helpful in kind of building that trust. It was a long and very windy road, but um, I think, you know, we came out with a stronger film because of it. And more importantly, Pim and her family, the larger community are incredibly proud of this final product as they should be because it's, it's all about them and, and their story um, being revealed to the world. And that leads into the question I had. I love the balanced stories of the women and the men. And it just reflects back on our American westernized culture of, no, periods are only about women, but this was about the whole, the, the, the village or the community. Can you talk about shining the light on the father's story and having males from, from the uh, tribe, if you will, um, talk about this? Pin the mom, basically, she puts it beautifully in a way that I think is so innate to indigenous peoples. Um, in my own culture, like there's a uh, hajo or like it, things in relation to each other or like creating a balance. And so I think there's, that is very much present in um, their own philosophies too. And their, their, their uh, stories, like the story of Dear Woman, which is about the ihuk really like heavily involves the men. And so like there's uncles and dads in that. And so like, there's, um, I think they, they as a community realize that like the center of this whole entire ceremony, like initially is about Ati and is about her becoming a woman, but it's also about like, how can the whole community come together? Because you don't just make, or like uh, have like Ati just become a woman. <laughs> it's like all the community has to come together in order to realize that and to like maintain that throughout her whole entire life and so like she'll grow up and she'll do the same for younger and then like maybe her cousins or her her younger brother Natez or her dad or someone will help contribute with that one thing that you know, when you're making um a short documentary time literally is of the essence and you know and 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 you're really trying to you know give us a lot of information in a very short compact uh, manner. Um, can you talk about the editing process and, and maybe some challenges in making sure that you paid service to everything that you wanted to and, you know, and yet keep a momentum with that? I think like, you know, when the decision was made to like not capture the ceremony itself and actually have the film be about everything kind of leading up to, um, to the ceremony, and more, more about community and all the people around her. I think it became very clear to us that like, this is not a film that is about delivering information to audiences. You know, I think again, like in documentaries, like we're so used to just being spoon fed information all the time and in a very like clear and direct way, there's always a push to like, you know, do voiceover and get it more, you know, get the information more clear and, it was kind of part of that, like wanting to respect the fact that this is their ceremony and that we're not gonna overshare, you know? Like there were things, there were more things that were captured, of course, than what ended up in this this film. Cause I think, what is the runtime? Like 20 minutes. Um, so a lot of it wasn't shared, but it was also like, how can we sort of create the feeling and the texture you know, the feeling that we felt being there. 
Um, it was more about it was more about capturing like the energy of moments and the feeling of the you know everyone being around one another and being together as opposed to the audience needs to very clearly understand this very specific thing that takes place during the ceremony. Um, so it was a little bit of a balancing act. Like how much do you share for people to be clued in and to really like most importantly to care and to be in invested, um, but but without oversharing, you know, without without getting too much into the the details or the weeds of things. So, you know, there it's it's a balance of that in the editing process and also how we captured a lot of the footage. I mean, you see a, a camera that is far away and it's generally wider and it's, you know, it's it's not about the details in the frame. Um, it's about kind of like standing back and feeling the energy of the room. Yeah, I, I love how in all of your answers is just this real emphasis on respect and boundaries and and knowing when to come in and um, and really finding the right subject. And, and, and so I'm curious to find out if you heard about the e-hook and you knew you wanted to cover it, you were just kind of scouting for the right family or the right girl to cover, or did you always know that it was going to be Ati? Yeah, so the process kind of, um, it, it goes like back many years um, to a film that I made a documentary called Period End of Sentence. Um, and I made it alongside the PAD Project, um, which I'm, I'm now a part of as well. It's a nonprofit organization and their mission is to sort of eradicate the stigma around menstruation worldwide through education. Um, and the PAD Project was behind this film as well. Um, and so after period end of sentence, which was a film that kind of, it really established um, the shame and the stigma around menstruation, specifically in Northern India. But after that film, there's sort of a, like we were, we were trying to figure out a way that we could sort of do the opposite. Like how can you find a story or a community of people that actually um, you know, for a long time have actually like had positive thoughts about menstruation and like really supported their girls during this time. Um, you know, instead of like just kind of jumping on the bandwagon of the menstrual hygiene movement that really was sort of kickstarted like a handful of years ago. Um, and so, so from that, we sort of started doing research and um, realize that, you know, there are a lot of native tribes that have um, coming of age ceremonies for young girls when they first menstruate. And um, they're really sort of positive experiences. And we, we um, then found, uh, I think it was like a blog post on the Ihuk ceremony that actually Pim had, uh, had a part in. It was about her older daughter, Ty's ceremony. Um, and then we kind of tracked him down on Facebook and did it the, you know, the social media way, but the old fashioned way, um, <laughs> the old, yeah, or the new fashion way rather, <laughs> but she was very excited and responsive and, you know, immediately, you know, responded to the request to connect with us. And, um, and then, you know, the rest is history. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, uh, considering um, that you're following up on an Academy Award winner and Sean Dean, that, you know, that, that you're continuing your, your Sundance streak going with this film. Uh, this one is, is just a wonderful follow up and uh, uh, really lovely. Again, the film is Long Line of Ladies. We've been talking to the directors, Sean Dean Tome and Raiko Zapachi. It's been wonderful talking to you about the film. Thank you all for the time. Thank you. If you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information about us, you can head to bitchtalkpodcast.com. This podcast is created, hosted, and executive produced by Aaron Lim. My co-host is Angela Tabora, a.k.a. Captain Party. The show's edited by producer Shar. We're powered by GoTo Productions. 